We receive the first animals here. We work with groups of 20. We can observe that the stocking rate in our heifer rearing unit is high. We are operating here, whether we like it or not, with 20% above our pen capacity. After leaving this phase around four months of age, the heifers move through progressively larger groups, following a gradual growth transition. We emphasize body condition scoring in this phase. Obesity is undesirable, except in specific cases such as Angus females, which tend to gain weight more easily due to their genetics. Jesse sent a message saying that he won't be making videos anymore because you haven't subscribed to the Santa Fe channel. So subscribe now and he will continue recording on farms around the world. We are now heading toward our calf housing facilities, where we will show some of the standard procedures carried out by the calf management team. Last night was somewhat atypical, with numerous calvings. Our farm operates 24 hours a day, and we maintain a dedicated calving team that continuously monitors prepartum cows housed in the maternity bay. Once a calving is identified, the calf is promptly brought to the calf barn, and the first intervention, which is navel disinfection, is immediately performed. The process has become increasingly automated. Notifications are sent via messaging groups, ensuring the calf team is informed and prepared. Simultaneously, information about the dam is communicated, so the colostrum is ready by the time she enters the milking parlor, allowing the calf team to assume responsibility for colostrum feeding. For all female calves, whether Holstein or Angus, we aim for a colostrum quality of 22% bricks, administered in a volume equal to 10% of birth weight within the first two hours. If the dam does not produce high quality colostrum, we either reconstitute powdered colostrum to reach the required bricks level, or we thaw frozen colostrum from the colostrum bank for immediate feeding. Esophageal feeding is used only as a last resort. Generally, we rely on patience and calm handling encouraging the calf to voluntarily consume the four liters of colostrum within the initial two-hour window. Meanwhile, the maternity pen is clean, straw is removed, lime is applied, disinfectant is sprayed, and fresh bedding is laid in preparation for the next calving. All new employees or trainees undergo a formal training program conducted by the calf management team. The goal is to ensure precise execution of every procedure from receiving the newborn, to warming, drying, and navel disinfection, and to eliminate any failure during handoffs between teams. We provide continuous training and periodic retraining to ensure process continuity and quality control. Here we have our newborn calves. They are typically born in the cross-ventilated free stall facility and immediately transferred to a receiving pen, where they undergo navel disinfection and colostrum feeding. Afterward, they are placed in individual hutches where they remain for approximately 30 days. We have 42 hutches, of which 30 are in use, while 10 remain vacant to allow for quarantine and sanitary downtime. During these 30 days, calves receive milk replacer only. No raw milk is used. Initial colostrum feeding follows the protocol of 10% of birth weight within the first two hours, followed by an additional 5% at six hours post-birth. Afterward, the calves receive two feedings of transition milk, then transition fully to a milk replacer. The current milk replacer is mixed at a 13% solids concentration, with a total of six liters administered daily. They are also offered commercial calf starter. After the hutch phase, they move to group pens. Due to herd expansion and increased calving rates, we are currently unable to maintain the full 30-day individual housing period. This month, we faced capacity constraints, and until the adjacent expanded hutch area is completed, calves are being moved to group housing around day 20. These are the challenges of growth. At present, we are bottle feeding approximately 60 calves. They remain on milk until around 60 days of age, followed by a 10-day weaning transition during which they shift to a fiber-based diet. Our average calving rate is two births per day. You may notice some Angus calves among the group. This was part of a strategy implemented two years ago to temporarily slow herd growth. We used sexed semen for the first artificial insemination, followed by Angus semen on subsequent breedings. As a result, some calves are black-coated. However, with the current herd expansion strategy, 
we have discontinued the use of Angus semen and are now working exclusively with Holstein genetics, aiming to increase the number of lactating cows. We sell these calves based on category and age, with prices ranging from 400 to 500 rees, depending on development. Even Angus crossbred calves receive the same high standard treatment as Holstein heifers, particularly during the pre-weaning phase, which reflects in their performance. It may sound surprising, but we have steers reaching 22 arobas by 12 months of age, which is a direct outcome of intensive care during the early stages of life. In general, Holstein heifers show consistent growth rates, but once they enter the post-weaning group pens, their performance accelerates. When housed alongside Holsteins, the weight gain of Angus cross steers is impressive. Our goal in the group housing phase is to promote social adaptation, room and development, and immune strengthening. We typically house eight calves per pen, offering them a total mixed ration, TMR, as well as the same commercial calf starter previously provided in the hutches. They progress through several stages until weaning is completed. This month, we also began using health monitoring ear tags, which provide real-time alerts whenever a calf shows behavioral changes or drops in activity, enabling early intervention. This technology allows us to respond to signs of dehydration, pneumonia, or other issues before significant developmental loss occurs. As I mentioned earlier, you may see male calves in the pens. These are Angus crosses, and they receive the same management protocol as the Holstein heifers. Many are already entering the pre-weaning transition phase. At this stage, calves are already on a solid diet, supplemented with small amounts of long fiber to support rumen development. The health monitoring system flags any calf that deviates from expected feeding or movement patterns. If a calf spends more time lying down, the system generates a health report, triggering pre-diagnostic evaluation. This helps us identify and treat conditions such as dehydration or respiratory disease before they compromise growth. The ear tag is applied on the fifth day of life, and it takes about five to seven days to learn the calf's routine. By day 10, the system establishes baseline behavior patterns and begins generating alerts for any abnormalities. Here, we have weaned calves, now housed in pens with approximately 16 animals per group due to our current stocking density. Here, the heifers are being prepared to move to another compost barn where they will remain until they reach the breeding phase. They are already receiving the same diet as they were in the previous pen. We have two pens with around 20 animals each, serving as transitional groups. Animals typically stay in these pens for about 120 days. The leftover feed visible here is from the previous day a new feed delivery will take place around 10 a.m. The diet provided here is essentially the same as that fed to lactating cows, consisting of corn silage, ground corn, soybean hulls, cottonseed, mineral premix, and soybean meal. Since we are still building our new feed center, we have temporarily limited the number of ingredients in the ration mixer as we await completion of new ingredient bins. Currently, we prioritize corn and soybean meal, alternating between soybean hulls and citrus pulp, depending on the quality of the corn silage. About a year ago, we had to start incorporating cottonseed, which previously was not part of our diet due to operational limitations. This farm takes pride in maintaining simple yet well-executed processes. The focus is on operational clarity for our team, simplifying execution while maintaining high standards. One differentiating factor here is that even yesterday's leftover feed has no off odor and the silage is exceptionally well preserved. Since we work with a 100% silage based forage system, our ensiling process is taken very seriously, especially compaction and proper inoculant application to avoid losses and ensure high dry matter intake. After weaning, calves are transferred to this barn starting with two 20 animal pens. We avoid high stocking density during this transition phase, particularly to ease their adaptation to headlocks, minimizing the risk of injury. During this phase, the calf management team remains responsible for monitoring whether the animals are feeding properly and adapting to the new environment. These calves are the first to be fed each morning, 
our workers arrive around 6.50 a.m., begin removing silage, and feeding typically starts around 7 a.m. to 7.10 a.m. These animals receive a custom ration with a slightly higher concentrate level to enhance the energy density of the diet. This strategy prevents overconditioning in later stages when higher energy diets are inappropriate. After leaving this phase around four months of age, the heifers move through progressively larger groups following a gradual growth transition. The progression begins with groups of 20, then moves to 40, and finally up to 80 animals per pen. Before feed is delivered, since the feed bunk score is already low, animals are briefly confined to the bedding area while the feed alley is scraped, currently still done manually with a tractor, unlike the lactating pens that already use scrapers. After the alley is cleaned, the feed is distributed, and animals are released for access. Since the animals are fully confined, and we maintain excellent environmental control, they are not exposed to parasitic pressure such as ticks and receive consistent feed intake. However, despite our high reproductive efficiency, we occasionally observe overconditioning in heifers aged 13 to 14 months. This excessive weight can negatively affect reproductive performance and in severe cases lead to complications such as ketosis during calving or even mortality. To avoid such losses, we adopt a preventive nutritional strategy focusing on controlled energy intake. Losing a heifer at the moment she begins to provide economic return is a major setback. For the dry herd, Except those in prepartum, we use two types of forages throughout the year. One of them is sorghum silage, particularly giant sorghum, which has low energy content and higher neutral detergent fiber, NDF, reducing dry matter intake by up to 2 kilograms per day. The other source comes from a local supply chain of green corn, widely sold in coastal and metropolitan markets. We purchase the harvested corn plants, post-ear removal, from neighboring farms and ensile, the vegetative fraction, specifically for the heifer grower phase. The challenge with post-harvest corn forage is that even with only 10% of ears remaining, it still contains residual energy and has lower NDF content. This can lead to excessive weight gain in breeding groups, especially if feed is not restricted. Sometimes we allow animals to run out of feed by 6 to 7 p.m. to avoid overconditioning. This particular pen houses 74 animals. Their average dry matter intake is approximately 6 kilograms per day. Their base ration includes corn plant silage, without the ear, with 28% dry matter. To this we add 1.1 kilograms of soybean meal and around 120 grams of mineral premix per head. Feed intake varies by group. Breeding groups consume up to 7.5 kilograms of dry matter Transition heifers consume around 6 kilograms. Newly moved animals consume approximately 2.5 kilograms. As I've mentioned, the farm's guiding principle is to simplify processes while ensuring precision and effectiveness. Instead of focusing on the number of feedings, we prioritize that each feeding is executed properly, that the feed is pushed up, kept fresh, and consumption is monitored to avoid performance losses. Since the farm owns its own self-propelled forage harvester, we currently chop corn silage at 11 millimeters. We are still evaluating whether to reduce particle size to improve compaction and fermentation. However, doing so may increase rate of passage and dry matter intake, which we do not desire at the moment as current consumption levels are satisfactory. Still, owning our own equipment allows us to experiment, monitor, and potentially fine-tune this aspect of feed preparation in the future. This is our rearing pen 6, where we house the breeding age heifers. All teams focus their attention here. Feed management, bedding, and especially reproduction monitoring. We do not use heat detection collars, so heat detection is carried out entirely by trained staff. The team operates via messaging groups, where any team member passing by can report an animal in estrus sharing her identification number. The reproduction team then verifies whether the heifer was mounting or standing to be mounted, confirms signs of estrus, and makes decisions on whether or not to inseminate. We emphasize body condition scoring in this phase. Obesity is undesirable, except in specific cases such as Angus females, 
which tend to gain weight more easily due to their genetics. These Angus females are now often used as recipients for embryo transfer. These heifers are reaching breeding age, and we aim for first service around 13 months, targeting first calving at 24 months. Last year, through proper planning, we reduced that to 23 months. It's worth highlighting, especially for nutritionists watching this video, that each case is unique. The diet we use for this category may cause weight loss on other farms, but for us, restriction is necessary to prevent overconditioning. Daily visual monitoring of animal groups is critical. Numbers and data are useful, but by the time performance metrics show an issue, it may be too late. So we assess the animal's physical condition, response to dietary changes, and muscle development on a daily basis to prevent performance losses in the future. This hands-on approach is key. Currently, our rearing pens are slightly overstocked, operating at about 20% above headlock capacity.